So now that we've covered the lies and how we were told by Jesus to fight them, and I gave a great example with Job in the Old Testament that supports my assertion, now I'm going to go to the New Testament and cover one of the most important and most poorly covered books, Galatians. Before jumping into this tiny book of the Bible, let me first provide some background information to set the stage. I'm doing this to show young people how relevant Christianity is. The church has failed to reach out to them. We need to take responsibility, connect with younger generations, and help them see the value of Christianity. We're too concerned about holding on to our traditions out of fear that we're willing to let generations just slide away. And believe me, eventually I'm going to address this point. Some churches believe bad things happen because of breaking rules, leading to misinformation among non-Christians, and I would submit it's also one of the main barriers to living with Christians. Galatians is a letter from Paul to a church he founded in Galatia. The location of Galatia is uncertain. Paul started the church during his first missionary trip. Galatia was significant to Paul. I believe it was his favorite, and the people there were ancestors of many Europeans, including Americans. The headquarters of the Christian church was based in Jerusalem at that time. However, the church in Galatia started to stray from the Christian message due to the interference from the Jerusalem church after Paul left. Even back then, the traditional church leaders and councils started screwing up the message. And you can see it in the letter to Galatians. Paul is angry. He starts off by saying, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I bet it's seldom mentioned that the ones doing the bewitchings were the leaders of the Christian church at Jerusalem. In fact, they went to the church at Galatia right after Paul left and started telling them things like, Okay, you can be Christian and Jesus saves but you still have to be circumcised, and you still have to keep the kosher laws. This included James, the so-called brother of Jesus, and the writer of the book of James, but that's a whole other story. In this letter, Paul is telling the Galatians that this is BS. That's the entire theme of the letter. Have you ever heard a sermon where the preacher teaches on Galatians without giving you this context? I personally think it's a very dry and boring book without it. Context is crucial when it comes to understanding biblical verses. Intended message may be unclear or misleading. Anyway, when Paul gets to Jerusalem after his first mission, he hears about these church leaders' nonsense and realizes they are trying to make Christianity just a small sect of Judaism and destroying the real message of Jesus. And that makes him angry. Before Paul writes a letter to the Galatians, an interesting incident occurs that he mentions in this letter. Paul and one of his Christian friends went to use a public bathroom, and James sent some of his friends to check if Paul's friend was circumcised. Paul mentions this in Galatians 5:11 to 12, where we find one of the most mistranslated, mistreated, and avoided verses in all of Scripture. It says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased? I would they were even cut off which troubles you. In context, this is Paul saying that if it bothers them bathroom peepers so much, they should just cut the whole thing off. You can probably see why this is so rarely preached on. Paul is definitely angry here. Here you can tell why having this context is important. Having this context makes this a great story, amusing and real. And it's also one of the best books that explains the good news message of Jesus. I remember driving to San Antonio with a friend and listening to a bunch of old tapes on Galatians. We talked about it, I explained it, and we talked about it some more. And still, it wasn't until almost six hours had passed by in the drive before they finally got the message. It was then that they said, oh my God, I just got it, grace and peace. The message of the gospel is simple, but sometimes it takes a while for us to understand it. And when we finally get it, it's hard to hold on to because it really is that simple. We'll start with the first few verses. In verse 1, the word apostle means a sent one, which implies that someone chose him to send a message and that there was a message to send. In this case, the person who chose and sent Paul is explained in the parentheses. In verse 3, the apostle then mentions grace and peace, which is the true message of the gospel that Paul is going to address and which should probably be the title of this whole book. The rest of verses 3 and 4 through 5 is an example of how the Jews back then are trained to think. It's a style based on authority. You'll often find things like this when they are explaining why what they said is true. Here, in this book, verse 1 through 6, Paul is saying something like, to all the people of the church of Galatia, from 
Paul, the man sent to you by Jesus, and God who proved Jesus was real by raising him from the dead, subject grace and peace to you from God and from Jesus who died for our sins in order to save us, an act that is what God wanted, and we all know God is the most important thing always. That's right, it's just like an email. It's got a to, a from, and a subject. Personally, when I was younger, I always thought it was kind of weird how all these New Testament books started that way. I thought it was kind of humble bragging over and over. But once I realized it was just the opening to a letter, just like an email, having that to and from and subject line, then it made sense. It also changes from bragging to context. That's why I start here and I don't ignore it or leave it out. It is the context for the whole letter. Now it makes sense that he is writing this to remind them that the message they got from him, who got it from Jesus, who got it from God's will, is grace and peace to save you from the evil world. When the church leaders told them, yes, Jesus saves, but you also have to do X, Y, and Z, they are contradicting that message, the message of grace. And if you think about it, as we saw in Job, this message is actually blasphemous and does not represent God. Just so you know, the word message and good news and gospel are all the same thing. They're synonyms. They're actually translations of the same concept. But let's start with grace. Most of the folks I talk to don't really realize that the Greek word for grace is charis, where we get the word charity or charisma. When looking at the concordance, you may notice that different word forms have the same entry, in this case, Strong's 5485. This is because they share the same root word, with different endings providing context for the word's role in the sentence. While these word endings do not always change the meaning of the word, they do add meaning to the sentence. I hope this makes sense to you. This first verse, 1 6, is saying that Paul is amazed that the people he taught and that have accepted Christ's gift of grace have now embraced a different gospel. Then he says this new gospel they got from the church leaders is not a gospel. This can be confusing unless you look at it as a message or a piece of news. What this verse means is I gave you a message, then you got another message, which really is not the message from Jesus, and so it's not from God. Then in verse 7, we get the first time he uses the word pervert in relation to people that go around spreading a different gospel. He actually sticks to this theme throughout this book and in other books that he writes. He considers the people that tell you anything other than grace and peace is the message of Christ is perverting the true message. He considers the people that tell you anything other than grace and peace is the message of Christ is perverting the true message. Think about that. The person who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament says anyone who adds anything to the message of Christ other than a gift you don't earn is a pervert. And you know what perverts do to you, don't you? It's really that serious. It's so serious that in the next verse, verse 8, he says if anyone tells you anything more than grace and peace is required, he hopes they are damned by God. That's what accursed means in the nice King James language. He then repeats that message again in the very next verse. This is important. I don't know about you, but if I hear something repeated over and over in the Bible, I'm going to pay attention. A lot of different people in a lot of different churches are trying to tell me a lot of different things about the gospel. I'd love to hear it straight from the Bible, simply, and in a way I can apply. What is it? Paul tells us that. Just a couple verses previous to this one. It's grace and peace. Grace is unmerited favor. You get this favor or gift and don't have to do anything to earn it. That's what unmerited means. And peace, or God, isn't against you anymore. The word here is irene, and it's translated as quietness, rest, peace of mind, the health and welfare of an individual. You get that? The message of the gospel is peace of mind without antidepressants. That's it. The first eight verses of Galatians convey a message that highlights the truth about God. I can stop right there and feel like I've demonstrated my point. But there's a lot more in this book of Galatians. My point here is that A common misconception that God punishes people when they do something wrong, and I'm here to demonstrate how this message in Galatians supports the truth and contradicts that misconception. In Job, his friends told him this very thing, and in the end, God said that was blasphemy, that it wasn't the truth about him. I can't cover all of it in Galatians without several hours, but just for this video, I'll move on to chapter 2 briefly. I just wanted to make sure you got the full picture, and I can't read this without pointing out the real message of the gospel, according to Paul, who is sent by Jesus, who is sent by God's will, is grace and peace. Moving on to the second chapter. Here he's saying that when he went back to Jerusalem, he had a Gentile with him named Titus, a guy everyone at the Galatian church knew. This is good. Everyone liked and respected Titus, 
You can see this in Galatians 2.1. Then here's the part where he says that they spied on them in the bathroom to see if Titus was circumcised. And this after they all agreed to Paul's face that circumcision wasn't necessary to be saved according to Jesus' message. You can see this in Galatians 2, verse 2 through 4. Now there's a lot in this. A lot was going on. It was a very early schism in the Christian church. A lot of it led by James. It was the same kind of situation that created the schism between the Sunni and the Shiite in Islam. The early schism in the church, led by James, the so-called brother of Jesus, was a fight between two factions. The main church in Jerusalem, led by Peter and James, was trying to make Christianity just a sect of Judaism, which would pervert Jesus' message. Paul stood up to them, promoting the opposite message of salvation through faith, not works. Then in verse 2-7, Paul outlines this schism by saying they saw that Peter was committed to one way and Paul to the other. All the talk of circumcision here doesn't have to be any more or less than that's what they were talking about. Do you have to be circumcised to be a Christian? There is a lot more involved with what circumcision means and what it stood for and how important it was in the relationship between the Jews and God. But really, all you need to know for this argument is that Paul kept mentioning circumcision simply because that's what the church leaders talked about when they perverted the message of Jesus. I could speculate that if I was in their shoes, I might feel either insecure that this thing that has been important for centuries is now being promoted is not important, or I might feel bitter that we had to do it and now these Christians are saying it's not important to God anymore. This kind of honesty about how they or I might feel about it is important. It's going to come up again and again in the Bible, and the same feelings drive a lot of the Christian problems today. In Galatians 2, verse 9 through 10, Paul again uses this authority argument, saying that rejecting the gospel as Paul preached it would also mean rejecting the teachings of those who were famously connected to Jesus at the time. And as Paul clarified earlier, this means all who attempt to add additional requirements to salvation beyond faith in Christ are false teachers. The next verses describe a shift in Paul's reported relationship with the other apostles, specifically Peter. Paul used an example to prove that faith, not works, is the way to salvation. He also wanted to show that he was not under Peter's authority. He answered only to Jesus, and by extension to God. When Peter visited Antioch, where Paul lived, they had a disagreement about this serious issue. Paul opposed Peter to his face because he knew that Peter was wrong. Paul exercised his own God-given authority as an apostle, or a sent one, with Peter. How could he have done that if he himself were not only sent by Jesus and by extension from God? That's why I spent the time explaining all this apostle and authority stuff. Every time you see the word apostle in the Bible, this is what it means. Every time. Why did Paul oppose Peter to his face right in front of a group of people gathered for a meal together? For the Jewish people, who you ate with had always been a big deal. While living under the law of Moses, they never ate with Gentiles. That was forbidden. They even avoided eating with other Jewish people who were thought to be leading sinful lifestyles. That's why Jesus generated so much controversy when he ate with tax collectors and sinners. The James and Peter faction still felt uneasy about sitting and eating with them. Because of God's grace, it was absolutely okay. They were no longer justified by following the law. They were brothers and sisters in Christ, after all. Paul was happy to see Peter eating with the Christians when he came to Antioch. However, a group of Jewish men who were associated with James arrived and so left the table with the Gentiles because Peter knew James wouldn't like it. Unfortunately, this caused other people to follow this example. For this, Paul called Peter out as a hypocrite. I just love Paul. Peter was grown up in a Jewish culture, being faithful to follow the law and Jewish customs. He had learned early on that is what made him good. Jesus had changed all of that. Peter agreed that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, it was not necessary for Gentiles to live as Jews under the law in order to be saved. But when he was in front of others, he caved. Because Peter was a leader, his actions influenced others at the table, including Barnabas, Paul's partner. It was an ugly moment, and Paul calls it what it was, hypocrisy. Peter cared more about what people thought of him than pleasing God. Paul confronted Peter in front of everyone because he believed Peter's actions were not in line with the truth of the gospel. Peter's behavior suggested that Christians were divided into Jewish and Gentile categories. But the gospel teaches that all are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by following the law. Grace, unmerited favor. Grace is how you're saved. Faith is how you live it. Being afraid of how other church people look at you is not faith. Paul then, in chapter 2, verse 14, used a question to challenge Peter. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews... Why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? 
I suspect Paul was motivated by a sense of outrage for his Gentile friends, but also because he believed that Peter's actions were not in line with the truth of the gospel. Paul could have been upset at Peter's actions perverting the message, but also sad with his friend. And then Paul drives home the point. Paul strongly argues that adding requirements like good deeds or rituals to the gospel of salvation is completely illegitimate. The good news is that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and any additions of works is in conflict with this message. This is both found in Galatians chapter 1, 8, 9, and chapter 2, 16. Justified in Christian theology simply means declared righteous. To be saved, to be in a relationship with the Holy God, he must declare us righteous in his eyes. The problem, of course, is that we aren't actually righteous, we're sinful. So how in the world can God declare us to be righteous? Digging into this, especially in the King James Old English language, is confusing to anyone. In verse chapter 2, verse 16, 17, there is a confusing mesh of the words justify law and faith, with a few Jesuses thrown in. What he's saying is, we know that we are saved by faith and not our efforts, and so we know that no one can be saved by good works. So then if we are saved and still sin, does that make Jesus somehow someone that promotes sin? Paul immediately eliminates one path to being justified or declared righteous by God, and that works of the law won't work, period. Nobody can be justified that way. The only way for anyone to be justified before God is through faith and belief in Jesus Christ. Earlier in this letter, Paul went so far as to point out that those who claim additional requirements are needed for salvation are not themselves believers, they are false brothers. This is in Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. Paul answers this in the last verse of the chapter, like a conclusion in his essay, by saying, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ died in vain. If we believe that we can be saved by our good deeds or keeping all the rules, then we are saying Jesus died for nothing. It's that simple. And this really sums it up for me. Paul acknowledges that the law is a way to salvation. If it wasn't, then Jesus couldn't have been made just by keeping it. It's just that no one has ever been able to do it throughout all of human history except Jesus. Up until this point, I'm sure most Christian theologians would agree with my interpretation. So my question then is this. Why would God be punishing us if all this is true? If all this is true and faith is what saves us, why then would God even bother to punish us in this life for breaking these rules? The very rules that the crucifixion eliminated. These questions are exactly the same question Paul asked. Some Christians will be offended I even asked them. I would take a look at myself why that is. I think God has a great sense of humor. First, the serpent tells Eve, eat that fruit and you'll know the difference between good and evil. Then he comes along with Moses and tells us exactly what the difference between good and evil are, writes it in stone. But he knows no one can do it. It's impossible. Then when we've gone through all the attempts and the rationalizations possible and think we've got it figured out, here comes Jesus who actually does it. Not only does he do it, but then he dies and pays the price for all of us. So we have a new way to salvation that completely destroys the law. And now we're still trying to do it the hard way by finding some way to keep the laws without claiming we're doing it 2,000 years later. This is what Paul means in these verses, why he asks, are you still trying to keep those laws to earn salvation? If the law is the way, then Jesus died in vain. Pay attention to that word vain. It's going to be important when we talk about the Ten Commandments. Even a little deeper, grace is unmerited favor, so if you do anything to merit it, it takes you out of grace. This is the part most people won't talk about. As far as you move into earning it, you move out from under the grace to that same degree. So going back to the part where he's talking about the perverts, trying to be saved by the works of the law is completely 180 degrees from being saved by faith. It's as completely opposite as you can get. This doesn't mean Jesus is the minister of sin. It's not okay to just break the laws and take advantage, but it acknowledges that we are human and we do break them. What it really means is that the effort or intentions we take in keeping the laws in order to be saved is the opposite of grace. And those efforts include judging yourself or beating yourself up, And they definitely include judging others and how well they measure up to any efforts in their life and definitely judging others on how well they are saved by looking at their circumstances of their life. We're going to get an even better illustration of this a little long. But at this point, I'm going to have to close out this conversation. For one of the smallest books in the Bible, there's so much good information in it. Martin Luther himself, the very founder of our Protestant faith, said he was married to the book of Galatians, and that's high praise. Some of the best biblical scholars that ever were would spend no less than 12 hours long sermons just to cover this little book. 
So I'm going to use this conversation to cover the point I'm trying to make, that the first lie from the start of this series, that God is punishing you in life for doing something wrong, that is a tool of the enemy. And then I'm going to cover the rest of the amazing messages from Galatians and additional discussions.